सभी को जोहार और जय भीम आई एम मिसिंग द कॉन्फ्रेंस इन द वाशिंगटन डीसी एरिया दिस ईयर आई एम नॉट देयर बट आई कैन एश्योर यू दैट ऑल ऑफ यू आर हियर विथ मी विद इन मी वाई आई से दिस इज बिकॉज आई हैव बिन वर्किंग इन इंडिया सिंस 2007 every year i would come back and spend 3 uh, to 4 months working with the communities at the margin while there is a lot of hope determination and courage is at the margins in the communities there is also intense suffering and sometimes witnessing this suffering or empathizing with the people undergoing this going through this suffering could be paralyzing it could paralyze one from taking action and that is where you need strength and for me the strength has been um aid volunteers aid partners and aid as a larger um organization and that is why i say uh that you all are here with me in one form or the other today i am speaking to you from a remote village in pakur district of jharkhand where we have been working for the past 4 uh, to 5 years why are we working here central india which comprises of jharkhand odisha chatisgarh madhya pradesh all these states is home to the largest adivasi population in india central india also happens to be one of the few remaining patches of large forests that are there uh, in india and uh, we we were not i think sufficiently engaged in these parts of india so while i was uh, you know i have been uh, spending this this time in india i i traveled intensely to the remoter parts tried to uh develop connections uh with good good group grassroots groups and movements and in the process slowly put together bring together grassroots groups doing good work bringing additional resource organization aid support aid volunteers and building a program uh from that you all are aware of uh, how we did that in the sundarbans with several uh, grassroots organizations we have done a similar thing in central india we are on uh, community driven um, ecological uh, restoration that's what brought us to this uh, part of india another very important uh, reason of of working in these margins is that the vision uh, and the possibility of a better world a a world with more equity and justice in it more humanity in it lies in these parts of the society um societies that are based on brahminical supremacy or white supremacy cannot give rise uh to this this kind of uh vision of of a better world when we are faced with existential uh crisis the the imagination in in the these so called mainstream societies have been have been narrowed down so so the so how how are we going to imagine a better society what will be the structures how can we live more uh, more generously more uh, more happily more uh, equitably on this world necessarily comes from this this part of the society and that is why we all in aid we work uh in the margins and and this too is the margin of of society i would like to um uh, quote uh, one uh, a person uh, working in one of the remote villages in the forests of north bengal a santhali man called konka uh, there is a big history which i am not going to go into uh, with him but you know he was a man who said that a uh, human animal conflict is rising because the forests are going down the elephants don't get their food there they come to the villages and then they destroy and try to eat the food 
of the humans uh, that uh, people are, are growing. And in the process, both uh, the animals and the humans are uh, left hungry. So when I asked him how many times he eats in a day, he said maybe once. If he gets one time food, they don't get the second meal. And But immediately after that, he said, but we are humans, we have small stomachs. I shudder to think what would happen to the elephants who have such a big stomach and go hungry. So a person who himself is going hungry can empathize with other life forms, understanding the larger web of life. This, these are glimpses of, of a better world, a, a more just and equitable and humane world. And we run into these examples every day and that's why I think the vision of a better world comes from the societies that are living at the margins but not always unhappily or uh, uh, it's, it's a mixed bag always but the structures of, of these societies are, are much more humane and, and have, a, uh, have a possibility. Whereas the mainstream societies, the, the, what we are supposed to talk about today, climate change, is an output, an outcome of these supremacist societies because their fundamental building block is, is oppression and, and exploitation. Either you exploit people of other castes, other classes, or you exploit nature to the extent that it runs dry and, and cannot uh, support life um, on earth. So, so we look, we work with these communities and, and we look at them and learn from them and stand shoulder to shoulder with them for working for uh, a better world. We know 200 million Adivasis or more or less that number, Adivasis and other traditional uh, forest dwellers live in forest and forest fringe uh, villages of India and they have been protecting the forests of India for, for, from time immemorial uh, until you know the British came and, and took over, transferred the ownership to the state and, and that conflict uh, continues to date. So these communities have a very deep understanding of, uh, of life and the web of life and how forests work and how forests can be healthy and how we are interdependent uh, with the forest. So we know and we think, we think and we know that uh, the Adivasis are the best custodians of, uh, of the forests in India. After, uh, uh, you know, one of, one of the main, uh, one of the main uh, outcomes of deforestation, which we have seen rampant in India because of mining, roads, other forms of development, uh, commercial interests, uh, loosening of protection, one of the main outcomes of deforestation is the death of a, ri of a river. Uh, um, rather, I should say, the murder of a river. And, uh, you know, if you are interested to know more about how rivers and forests are connected, you can join the watershed group or the environmental cell uh, a group of volunteers uh, where we have discussed all of this um, many, many times and we would do so, uh, you know, many more times to come. The rivers in East and Central India are running dry for large parts of the year and it's causing tremendous suffering to, uh, to the people. It was only last month uh, some volunteers along, uh, along with some volunteers I had gone to western districts of Odisha where we have been working for about six, five, six years uh, now. Uh, Maha, Bala, Vasu, Partho, uh, all of them have witnessed firsthand how women in, in Bolangi district of Urissa have to dig 10 feet into dry riverbeds to access water for their homes for drinking, cooking and other uh, daily needs. Now add to that the heat waves that are going through India. In fact, right now I'm standing under the sun, it's, it's, it's really, really hot and uh, you know, in, in these conditions, people have to work and survive, and if they can, if they have to do that without water, it's uh, you know it's devastating. And the the this uh, the 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 load of or the burden of of getting water for the household falls disproportionately on women and and young girls. Uh, 
uh, you know, they have to walk kilometers to get the fetch, uh, you know, a, a bucket of water or a, or a pot of water, uh, missing all other things that they could be doing to improve their lives, lives of their families um, and, and communities. So anywhere we have seen in central India, uh, you know, women are, are always carrying and fetching and digging for, for water. And this is not one or two instances, this is the rule. Uh, lakhs of women are subjected to this every day, every summer, uh, the, uh, the water uh, runs out. So it is, it is at this intersection of Adivasi homeland and the forests of India where we have very deliberately chosen to work. Uh, you know, these are not project proposals that have come, but we have traveled uh, through, the, through the heartland of, of India, of, of the central India, and sought out groups and movements and communities and have started engaging with them, bringing together communities, bringing together other essential uh, resources that are uh, needed for it. And that has been a, a very important, uh, you know, uh, part of the work that I have been engaged in. Now, um, there has been a long struggle, like I said, Adivasis have lived, Adivasis and other uh, forest dwellers have lived in, in, the, um, um, uh, in the forests of India for a very uh, long time. So after a long decades of struggle, uh, the Forest Right Act of 2006 was brought, uh, was made into law in the Parliament of India. And uh, the, the, the main goal of this uh, act was, or law, was to undo the historical injustices that pe the Adivasis have uh, suffered um, in, in India, in the forests of uh, uh, India, and, and affirm their rights to live in the forest area, forest and foreign fringe areas, to, uh, to pursue their uh, sustainable livelihoods, for example, collecting mohua, collecting kendu leaves or broomsticks and such, and also their right to protect and conserve forests. And uh, because this was an outcome of long decades of struggle, uh, the, the law was, uh, there was a, a very uh, deliberate effort made to make the law very Pro people and and people's uh, people friendly, but obviously that did not happen, and people are still struggling uh, for their rights. And uh, you know, people who do not have record keeping in paper are being asked to show their uh, domicile from like three generations ago or things like that, which is an impossible uh, feat uh, to do. But that is what we have been working with uh, groups and movements so that people get these rights. Uh, Particularly, we have been working in the western districts of Urissa, which are very drought-prone, Bulangi, Nuapara, Bargor, Kalahandi, all these areas. Um, and and these are, this is also a seat of, of back-baking poverty in India, like we cannot believe, bonded laborers, you know, almost slavery-like conditions, people being taken in buses and, and trucks to Hyderabad and other places to build bricks under uh, slave conditions without uh, pay, you know, being held hostage for years together, sexual abuse and what, what not. Um, uh, so, so, so we have been working there for the past six, seven years to to bring, the, use this uh, law in in favor of the people to get their rights. Similarly, in uh, uh, in North Bengal also, we have been working on this Forest Right Act with communities in about two hundred. Uh, villages spread across five districts um, and this is a very complex region because uh, the British had brought together uh, lakhs of Adivasis from central India and also northeast and such to work on the forest to cut down natural forests and, uh, and replace them with teak plantations and other plantations of, of commercial interest. So uh, you know about, uh, about 30 odd tribes live in very close proximity uh, to each other in, in the forests of North Bengal. And it's a very challenging and also a fascinating place to understand uh, how diverse India is, how diverse people's worldviews are, things and, uh, you know, how they look at things and, and all of that. 
you know there are um, there are rabhas uh, rajbongshis mech garo santhal bhil munda shobor all tribes that we can think of in central india are are present in um, in the forests of north bengal and there also we have been working on this forest right act and uh, i would like to remind ourselves that in aid also we say uh, sangarsh seva or nirman and you know when it was articulated by uh, shankar guhanyogi uh, he had obviously he had said sangarsh or nirman and and uh, how i have interpreted this is he is pointing to the political responsibility of social movements and social responsibility of political movements one cannot go without the other so uh, following that and following our own sangarsheva nirman uh, the same one and the same thing uh, in in north bengal we have been talking about sustainable livelihoods just fighting for rights alone wasn't taking uh, you know was leaving one part unaddressed so we had been working we had been uh, talking about it for many years and last year we wrote a grant and through that this was made possible and uh, in the past one one year uh, you know about 6 700 families have engaged in sustainable agriculture in the forest areas and uh, this is the first time or or at, at, at least after a gap of many many decades people were growing a second crop the the rabi uh, crop in the winter of of uh, vegetables of jute of mustard and many of these families made a good profit of you know like 10 to 15000 rupees uh, or what uh, this was the this is like extra money that they did not have uh, before obviously we can improve on this but this was the first time uh, we have planted more than or or planning to uh, put in more than 50000 saplings of native varieties in the forest to 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 reforest the areas and these are all community uh, led efforts uh, and that's where we would engage we would we do not see uh, f- uh, you know environment ecology or forest without the people at least in the context of of india um so that has been a, a great learning for us in the in the uh, for in the forests of north bengal and we are also engaging in education that is culturally and ecologically sensitive for the young adults uh, there uh now the second thing we are doing which you could say uh, as part of addressing uh, climate change is um, is community led ecological revival or rejuvenation through watershed restoration today i am standing here in the in a pahadia village of uh, jojotola you can see behind me there is a check dam and further down uh, further back in the background where you see the earth uh, dug up those are contour trenches that the community have made and the principle is uh, very simple simple of of um, you know stopping soil erosion and of um, uh, of slowing down the water over the slopes of these hills some of the hills you will see here are are forested some of them are barren and then if i uh, move to the left you will see uh, stone bunds uh, what we call here as a uh, merbandi and and these uh, you know few years ago i would not have imagined that uh, you know merbandi could play such an important role in in basically uh, transforming uh, a village um, and as you know uh, we work with both communities here um santhal community which are more settled in the in the valley and pahadia communities which are settled on top of the hills and, and this is one such uh, village and um, um and uh, you know pahadia communities are known uh, as uh, particularly vulnerable tribal groups uh, uh, because because their numbers are going down only uh, some 30000 uh pahadias are left in india the the saudia pahadias there is another sub uh sub part of uh, pahadias that are there uh, but the saudia pahadias are 
are uh, very few of them are left in India, about uh, 30,000 of them. Uh, and, and numbers are going down. They're very, very marginalized. And, and over the years, what we realized, you know, one of the main reasons for, uh, for this is uh, the, the loss of their soil because uh, they do what they call kudwa kheti, no-till agriculture, and they dig the soil and put a seed. They don't plow the land. But when they do that on steep slopes, what happens is, I wish I could show you here, maybe I will uh, add some time later, the, the steep slopes uh, see uh, intense erosion and, and, you know, in a few years they cannot grow anything. And that has led to tremendous food insecurity, water insecurity and all of that. And they are exploited for their labor uh, in mostly in eastern India. Um, they don't travel too far, uh, but wherever they go, they're exploited, um, you know, very, uh, very significantly. Uh, so in uh, we we you know uh, made, uh, in, in in the process of trying many things, Merbandi was one thing we started dying, and here our friends in Jharkhand Vikas Parishad, uh, you know worked with them very diligently, very persistently, and started doing this Merbandi uh, on the on top of the hills, uh, which which started uh, you know saving the soil. It would not let them run away, and then we saw that there are some villages who have done stepped agriculture. All, Although we knew it, we did not know, you know, people would shift so easily. But, uh, but in the last few days I have been here, we are noticing people are ready to shift. And we actually did a Shramdan yesterday with another commu Pahariya community in Boropahar. And we built a second line, a third line of these uh, stone barns. And uh, over time what happens, the soil flows and flattens out. And it gives them a much better land to... Uh, cultivate and and we are very hopeful that this will be transformative to many Paharia um, uh, Paharia villages and um, and like that this is one one example uh, you know there are other uh, examples also uh, that uh, you know that that have transformed uh, people are beginning to uh, see the effects of it and and taking it taking it on and making it their uh, own. In Jharkhand, we are working in four districts on uh, this community-based uh, watershed restoration. Madumka, uh, uh, Pakur, Koderma and Giridi. And about 100 square kilometers of area is right now under ecological uh, survival. Of course, we are doing it in a step fashion you know, slowly, slowly increasing the, uh, the area. Today I am again standing by a river in, uh, in Pakur. We, we saw the, the work being done. All the upstream uh, nalas and small rivulets and brooks and all to hold water has given life to this, uh, this river, uh, which will again go further and, and many such rivers will form, uh, for join again and, and form a bigger river. But um, as you can see, this is a, you know, uh, this river is coming back to life. Uh, it was not completely dead, but there is much more water flowing in it, um, in it uh, today. Uh, similarly, in uh, Hirapur, in Dumka, you know, the forest has come back and the forest has come down towards the village by about 50 meters since when we had started. So the forest is uh, bouncing back. The groundwater level has risen by uh, 10 feet in some of the areas in the villages. And of course, as you can understand, that represents the, the um, going up of groundwater level and access to water. And many more people are doing agriculture. The number of uh, the area under the second crop in Hirapur has doubled since we started. Uh, so people used to just do the first crop in monsoon and not do the Ravi crop just because there was no water. And, and now they are doing, uh, you know, not just the first crop, but a very uh, healthy second crop. Similarly, in Koderma, there are a couple of villages, uh, Kosmai, Deopur, which have become water sufficient. Um, they are completely on their own as far as water goes. Their wells are always charged. They are doing a full-fledged uh, second, second crop. The, the transformation has been amazing. And in fact, we are planning a Jal Yatra uh, there because there are other villages in the vicinity which are suffering from acute 
water crisis and and we will in uh, in june sometimes in june we plan to march along with the people of osmai and deopur and go to all these drought prone villages to share the experience how you know water came to their village and how life has been transformed um, uh, by that similarly in giridi also we are seeing uh, massive changes uh, you know we are seeing um, wildlife coming to take bath to drink water in 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 the pools created by uh, small gully plugs that we have done um, around the uh, the nala so this this uh, this river here as you can see people are bathing and and cleaning and some people are fishing uh, upstream and uh, in the in the winter when the rabi crop the both uh, you know field on both sides of this river were full of of crop uh, largely mustard and that is possible because of this river so this this a river a pond um a spring brings back life um to uh, to the village and then people can figure out um on their own now switching gears a little bit not far away from here just maybe a few hundred kilometers if as the crow flies we have been as you know working in sundarbans and it has been largely on sustainable agriculture but two years ago we were forced uh, to to shift our focus and before that uh, you know we we were very afraid to uh, you know what is this climate change this is so big what can we do about it it's beyond our control in that mode but when uh, you know cyclone after cyclone started happening and people got more and more desperate we saw that kind of uh, paralysis was not uh, not an option so uh, so we organized with the people we and and, and figured out that Yeah, this building this mangrove buffer around the island is perhaps the most effective thing we can do along with the people and and we jumped into it in the last uh, two years uh, the uh, you know mainly women women groups uh, have planted about 5 lakhs which is 500000 mangrove saplings most of which survived one cyclone uh, you know which is 30 feet uh, high uh, water surges and and that's been uh, phenomenal and whether you know everything survives whether we are able to do it or not completely remains secondary uh, uh, secondary to the fact that we can take it on collectively with the people because impossibility is something uh, you know people in india overcome on a daily basis so so we have to be prepared uh, and and work with the people uh, to take take that on in sundarbans this year also we are planting about 200000 uh, to 300000 mangroves and uh, the idea is to uh, you know get more and more <clears throat> people involved in building this buffer of mangroves and uh, and uh, you know taking on this huge specter of of uh, climate change and rising seas and uh, that also is an impossibility but we have to definitely uh take it on there are areas in sundarbans where the mangroves many people are saying will not survive but we are ne- most more ne- more importantly trying to see if we can make the mangroves uh survive in in those areas uh um because in 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 the you know in in the softer parts which is not turbulence it's not facing the turbulence of the seas not strong winds uh, mangroves will grow anyways but it is the more vulnerable places where uh, they are not surviving and that's what we have to take on and we are trying that and will emphasize on the protection of those uh, mangroves this year along with planting and nurturing a few a few years ago uh, what we are i'm standing on the top of the watershed we have taken on in nipponia and and this is in in uh, in pakur district and a few years ago this seemed like an impossibility uh we had started with one small micro watershed about 6 kilometers uh in area but today as you see right from the top of the hill there if you follow uh, let's say if you follow an imaginary line on top of the hills that you see all along there and then The, it ends in the valley and as you see the valley um, almost 
as far as your eyes go. That is the watershed uh, rejuvenation we have taken on. And again, on, the, on my left, you will see another series of hills. And the line goes all the way um, about uh, maybe 10, 15 kilometers and then comes back to trace uh, itself over the ridge of those mountains. And this is the entire entirety of, of the valley area that we have taken on for rejuvenation. And, and like I said a few years ago, this was an impossibility. Uh, we started with six square kilometers and we, now we have taken on about 120 square kilometers. It's not going to happen in a day. It's not going to happen in a year. It will be years. But it has given us a vision. It has given the people of this region a vision and, and a sense of being united by this one river which is called Shorunala. And all villages are contributing to it and reaping the benefit. And that's what our rallying cry is, that we have to revive the Shorunala that, so that it becomes a, a perennial uh, river. And, and the, the, through discussions in the different villages, uh, the slogan that is slowly emerging is Gaon ka pani gaon mein rakho, gaon ka mitti gaon mein rakho, gaon ka jungle gaon mein rakho. Because if we, if we do not let uh, water escape from the river, uh, soil escape from the river, we will be improving the health of the village and everyone's health. So, when, when to summarize our work in climate change, first we are talking about implementing Forest Right Acts and Forest Rights Act uh, in, in, the, in uh, most parts of India where there are forests, where Adivasis and traditional forest dwellers have their right to live. And, and conserve and uh, pursue their livelihoods. Second is ecological, uh, community-led ecological rejuvenation that we just talked about, and also the, um, you know, the, the mangrove plantation in, in Sundarbans. So these are the uh, very specific three efforts that we have taken, all of which are significant. Like I said, 100 square kilometers is already under rejuvenation, under watershed, the FRA, uh, we estimate something about 4,000 to 5,000 square kilometers of uh, forest land is uh, the catchment where we are working is about that and Sundarbans 500. So this, like I said, uh, you know, these were maybe impossibilities a few years ago and we should not uh, be paralyzed or, um, um, or be overwhelmed by this impossibility of climate change or impossibility of taking on uh, climate change because uh, you, uh, like I have repeated again people in India uh, uh, you know they, they live and outlive impossibilities every day by the millions people survive on a body mass index of 11 which uh, you know which is considered uh, you know dead like basically not enough fat to sustain life in the body. Hundreds and thousands of people survive uh, like that. A trans person survives daily violence. Dalit people survive daily violence. There are Adivasis who have been displaced for, you know, two times, three times in, in their lifetimes. So these are uh, uh, impossibilities that people survive. And, and we have to be courageous and jump in and it, it, it's not going to be in our comfort zone, but, uh, but we all, you know, together we can make a, a sincere effort at taking on these impossibilities and make it uh, uh, possible. And in, in some ways there is no other uh, alternative. Mani, what else are we going to do? Sit and uh, wait for Sundarbans to be drowned or wait and uh, wait and, uh, you know, wait for Jharkhand to become a desert? We cannot do that right and neither can the people obviously it's not just us everyone's thinking that way so we have to uh, jump in and uh, you know uh, collaborate and stand shoulder to shoulder these people and take it on and and we have to make uh, difficult choices sometimes and i would appeal to all um, eight volunteers to consider very seriously giving more time uh, to a group like aid or 
or you know even if you want to do it directly uh, on the ground uh, that's also very very uh, useful but since you are uh, maybe comfortable with it you can consider that uh, you know part time full time whatever but it it will take significant energy from people uh, all over the wor world with all different kinds of skills or just just uh, you know just energy and resources that people can bring into and and take on the cause and i will close here uh, thank you all very mo uh, very much and um, um, once again uh, jai bhim jai virsa or jindabad